Welcome to webinar number seven in this free webinar series the Bubble Pain Society are running at this time. Uh, I'm Sharon Goulbert, trustee of the Bubble Pain Society, pain science educator and therapist. Uh, in the last seven weeks, we've had a host of multidisciplinary experts on. Please get in touch if there are any that you haven't seen or you'd like to see what we've covered. Um, and you can email us at info at vulvalpainsociety.org. As usual, Kay Thomas from the VPS is in the background in the chat box. Uh, we had, uh, I think, 108 registered for today. So we have a lot of questions. Our expert today is Selena Doggett-Jones, integrative relationship and psychosexual therapist. Welcome, Selena. Thank you for, for being here. Hello. Uh, Selena has already had a look at the questions we've received in. And she's kindly put together a presentation to start, which hopefully will answer quite a few of those. And then afterwards, we'll take any more questions that haven't been covered. So, um, Selena, before you get started with the presentation, could you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, psychosexual therapy? Um, what's your role within that relationship, that therapeutic rel relationship when it comes to verbal pain? Um, so I've had a bit of a journey to get to this uh, particular career. Um, I'm uh, talking about this because I think it's relevant, the transfer uh, transference of skills and the sort of holistic approach. Um, I started off as a performing artist. I then became a nurse. I then specialised in contraceptive and sexual health. And I then went into psychosexual work. And then I did some more training in relationship work. So um, I often see people with different kinds of pain. It's not always vulval pain. It could be chronic fatigue. It could be multiple sclerosis. It could be um, rheumatoid arthritis. And um, I noticed that Dr. Winston Damalia, who you had last week, uh, had a very holistic approach to pain. And I think that's my approach, um, that we have to look at what feeds into that and also although that might sound quite provocative, sometimes what purpose might that pain be serving in a relationship in order to avoid sex? Um, now, I absolutely don't want to um, in any way suggest that I don't believe the pain exists because I know it does. Yeah. But I think it's worth exploring the impact of that pain and being realistic about the relationship before the pain started and um, it can be quite easy to sort of think, oh, it was all great beforehand. And my question is, was it really? And looking at what sex was like or what might it be like without pain? I don't know if that's answered okay. your question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my role is to be supportive, empathetic, curious mm. with the client as to what's going on. Mm. So it's, you know, psychosexual therapy plays a really important part, doesn't it, um, within that multidisciplinary care. Um, so I wonder, Selena, do you want to share that presentation with us so we yes. can get started? Great. If I can um, work out how to do that, which we practiced earlier. Yes, we did. Uh, let me see. I'm supposed to share the screen. There we go. Ah, uh, share. Right, is that? That's it, it's sharing. Uh, good, okay. So, uh, first of all, I wanted to warn you all um, that obviously we're talking about sex and intimacy, so I'm going to use very explicit language and um, talk about things that we don't normally talk about because they're very personal. So I'm not gonna shy away from that, so that's just a warning on that front. Uh, now, I, made a, made a, uh, I may have made a mistake, um, but I didn't think that um, Dr. Mello last week talked about sexually transmitted infections. So I just want to acknowledge that those do cause pain. Most of them are treatable, but herpes is not. I mean, it's treatable, but it's not curable. And people who have herpes and have uh, frequent outbreaks, that is very painful. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about evolval pain is that it has a stigma to it. 
anything to do with genitals in a way has a stigma, especially in this country. It might be a bit different in the Netherlands or in Sweden or some of these more open countries, but we're a culture really of nudge, nudge, wink, wink. We talk about down there. Well, what's down there? Our knees, our feet are down there. But, you know, we use that, well, I don't, um, and I hope most medics don't, but there are some that do. When we have a headache or an earache, we don't talk about, oh, I've got a bit of a problem up there, do we? Uh, so as, as, as well as the pain, we're dealing with a stigma. If you want to go to a social um, function and you don't feel well because you've got rheumatoid arthritis and you're having an exacerbation, no one will question it if you say, look, I've had an exacerbation, I really don't feel up for it. But not many people feel that comfortable saying, I've had an exacerbation of my vulval pain because you're afraid the host might say, oh, too much sharing. So let's acknowledge the stigma. Could the pain be useful, which I just touched on before? If the relationship, if you're in a relationship, is um, difficult, um, if it's controlling, for example, if uh, there's a lot of anger and resentment, uh, difficulties over the way you're parenting, all sorts of different things can cause a person not to want sex. So it's about um, thinking about, is the pain a reason for you not to pursue the sexual relationship? It's not dismissing the pain, but is it possibly being used to avoid intimacy? Reality check, which I touched on before. What was sex like before the pain? Uh, what do you think it might be like without the pain? And is that a realistic expectation? I'm not going to talk very much about same-sex relationships because they very rarely present with pain, at least in my practice. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it tends to be that women uh, having sex with other women don't seem to... They may have the problem with the pain, but they seem to be able to negotiate sex better, perhaps perhaps because they're more explorative with non-penetrative sex. Um, but I don't want to not acknowledge them. Um, I just want to say that I won't be talking so much about um, that particular group. Right. Oops, I think I've missed one. Hang on a sec. Right. Uh, looking at it holistically, I think we have to consider culture, religion, spirituality, because they impact on our approach to sex. Uh, family of origin messages can be very different in different cultures. There can be myths that descend through families um, and are very ingrained. Uh, the common discourse, multimedia messages, you know, oh, we should all be having sex this often um, and uh, this kind of sex. Uh, often it's not true and um, my approach is, you know, you're having sex as often as you want to as a couple and it's absolutely not relevant what, what's being said on social media. General education level is also important to consider. Um, I remember having a lawyer who'd had three children and um, she was probably in her late 30s and she rather shamefacedly said to me, I really don't know what my insides look like. And to reach that age in this country, especially where we do have an education system, seems quite extraordinary to me not to really know. I had another woman who didn't know where her urethra was. Um, so I don't know quite what's going wrong in school, that, that people aren't being taught these things. Mm. Um, anatomy and physiology, so I'm talking um, about the same thing there, really. Uh, class, income, sexuality, sexual identity, nationality, race, and there are many more things to consider, but they all feed into our approach to sex and intimacy. There are also... Um, um, beliefs around pain so there are certain cultures that might be very stoic about pain it's not okay to admit you're in pain you've got to just put up and shut up and there are other cultures who are much more vociferous about it negative messages about sex there are many for example no sex before marriage and that seems to be especially for women sex is for having babies it's not for pleasure Self-touch and masturbation is dirty, again, often, especially for women. Um, it's not important for women to climax. Now, I will have women who um, have various sexual issues. They may never have climaxed and they may not want to. So it's not something I would impose on them. Um, but I think that if it's something you do want to explore and you want to accomplish, then um, that needs to be addressed with your partner and 
primarily with yourself because I don't think you can expect a partner to help you climax if you don't know how to do it yourself. Sex means sexual intercourse. Does it? Not in my book. Though I often have clients say to me, oh, we did this, they did oral sex or they did all sorts of other touching, but that doesn't count. Well, it does count. I see sexual intercourse as an option on a menu. And I think that can be really difficult if you suffer from pain, you think well, we're not really doing it properly because we're not having intercourse. Women's vaginas are, and vulvas are smelly and dirty. They're self-cleaning, you, um, you know, wash regularly, and I would not advise soap, especially if you have a history of pain. You don't need soap, just warm water is all you need. If you do have bacterial vaginosis, that is smelly and it needs treating. Fortunately, some women have that chronically. Um, another myth, if you don't give ma a man what he wants sexually, he will suffer physically and mentally and get blue balls and might leave you. Now, I actually had a client very recently, a young client whose mother said, you know, once you're married, you need to be having sex three times or the man will suffer. Yes, he might feel frustrated, but he's not going to get blue balls. How is sex talked about in the family? It often isn't. Uh, often the television's turned off if there's anything sexual on the television. If something's not talked about or addressed, the message usually is don't go there. There's something shameful about it, there's something embarrassing about it. That doesn't mean you have to talk in great length to your parents about sex. Most kids don't want to know their parents have sex. They do want to know they're intimate and stable on the whole. Sexual abuse in the family doesn't have to be in the family, but if it is within the family, it's an even greater betrayal of trust if a family member has sexually abused someone, and that can interfere with your approach to sex. Um, I see people who are in arranged marriages, often very happy in the relationship, um, but it's the blind leading the blind. If both of them have no experience, um, it's quite difficult for them to learn how to go about it. We think it's instinctive and natural, but actually we learn how to be uh, confident in bed. Family messages, it will hurt, it'll be a bloodbath. I've had clients who've told me that their aunts, cousins, etc., before their wedding say, it'll hurt like hell and it will be a bloodbath. Now who is going to be relaxed if that's what they're told? Certainly not me. Uh, going back to the common discourse, frequency as a relationship measure. I often see clients who say, oh, I feel really guilty because we're only having sex once a week. We should be having it three times a week. Well, who says? Who says you should be having sex three times a week? Oh, well, the media or the WhatsApp group I'm in or the this or the that. Sex is as often as you want it to be. You also need to think about the quality of the sex versus the quantity. But people do use frequency as a measure of the state of the relationship quite often. Discrepancy of desire, which is when one person is more interested more often than the other, is very common. In fact, I would say it's across all relationships and it needs managing. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, I've recommended a book at the end of this talk by Emily Nagowski called Come As You Are. Uh, she talks about spontaneous versus responsive desire, which is a useful um, kind of hypothesis, I think, because there are people who feel very spontaneously sexy or horny, just it comes out of, it appears to come out of nowhere, whereas other people respond to seduction, to uh, romance, to context, to little subtle suggestions, and then they will feel sexy. So, you know, I'll have people say, oh, they never, they never um, initiate sex. And if they understand the difference between those two people, they can uh, not take it personally and realize that that person needs a bit of coaxing, needs a little bit of um, what Dr. Um, Karen Gurney calls uh, currency, sort of currency throughout the day. Oh, we're only having vanilla sex, you know, and I've seen all this porn or my partner's seen all this porn. We're not doing any of those BDSM things or hanging from ropes or whatever else. Uh, if that's not for you, it's not for you. There's no, there's no shoulds about this, is, I think is what I'm trying to say again. Um, I think I've sort of covered the um, many women haven't looked in a mirror, don't know their own anatomy. Um, 
as far as vaginismus goes, I think of the vagina as a potential space. And I forgot to bring my paper bag, but I sometimes show them a paper bag. You could use a glove or a sock and show that it's sort of flat, um, it, you know, that you can't see a great cavernous hole. Uh, the space is created by inserting the penis or the hand into a glove. And when they get the idea that the space becomes a space once something enters it, as long as the vagina is relaxed. Uh, women often aren't very familiar with the penis, so it's a scary thing. So it's about getting familiar with your uh, partner's penis um, and realising it's a particular penis. It's not any penis, it's his penis. And uh, being familiar with it uh, can help um, it become less frightening. The politics of penetration is something I talk about. You know, I want to know why a woman wants sexual intercourse and for the reasons to be valid, i.e., not just, oh, because I should be having it or because my partner wants it. What does it mean to you? What do they think it means? What do they think it's about? The other thing that can be helpful is understanding that men also have difficulties. Now, I'm not talking about pain necessarily that there, although men can get lichen sclerosis, they can have phimosis, which is a type foreskin, um, which can be very painful and make sex impossible. And when women realize that actually um, men can have problems too, if they're in a couple, it sometimes shares the responsibility of it. It becomes a co, um, a co problem, um, and relationships are co created, and sexual problems are co created, and that can feel normalizing. How should a vagina look? How should a vulva look? It should look like yours looks. Now, you might say, ah, but I've got blisters, I've got a rash, I've got scarring, I've got disfigurements due to um, surgery, I've got other problems that make it unsightly. Yes, and you need to try and treat those and do the best you can with them. But ultimately, there is a huge variety of vulvas. I don't know if any of you have looked at the Great Wall of Vagina, which is an art piece. Um, it's called the Wall of Vagina, but actually it's vulvas, um, and it's plaster plaster um, moulds of uh, a great many vaginas on a wall. If you Google that and look it up, you can see the wide variety of vulvas um, that uh, women have. I happen to know how many varieties there are because I've done a great many smears in my working life. But unless you are a woman who sleeps with women, you often haven't seen anyone else's vulva. So improving sexual experience, context, which I've touched on, um, if it worries you, the idea of being overheard, turn a radio on, address that, uh, make sure you're not overlooked unless that's something that's exciting to you. Uh, make sure you've got time to enjoy it, to be aroused, not rushed. The dishwasher grab, I call it. Um, uh, this is when you're emptying the dishwasher, leaning over and your partner thinks, oh, that looks sexy, grabs your bottom or your breasts and you think, oh Christ, this is not the time for sex. I'm in the middle of this. This is no build up, nothing. I'm not interested. Another woman might think, yes, I'm going to drop everything and have sex. People are different. Uh, communication. Um, there's a website called the We uh, Doctor. Um, I can't see it because it's covered here, but it, um, oh, her name's um, Dr. Betty Martin. She's a sexologist. She has a website. The wheel of consent is a very interesting idea. Uh, there is an exercise on there. She talks about giving, receiving, taking pleasure, allowing access to your body and thinking through these different concepts. Something else that is useful um, is the five love languages. Um, Gary Chapman. Uh, if you Google him, you will see what those are. Um, they are thinking about how people like to be cared for and loved. Um, and how you like to receive care and love. So um, those are tasks, verbal affirmations, time, quality time, physical um, intimacy and sex, and um, gifts, not expensive gifts. It might be, you know, something a, a very small, even a gift you could think of as a text or a little note that you leave. What what can cause a problem is when one person thinks the other person wants to be given uh, in one way and in fact they want to receive in a different way and, and it opens up a useful conversation. Anger, hurt, roadblock to intimacy. Non-sexual touch. When, sex, when uh, genital sex isn't possible, 
There's lots of other ways you can touch. Breasts are, for many women, arousing. Women can actually orgasm if their nipples are stimulated. Um, and that can be worked on. So it's about looking other ways. I think what's really important is that if sex isn't possible because of vulval pain, let's not keep thinking about what's not possible. Let's think about what is possible. So it's not sort of, you know, all abandoned because there's still lots of opportunities to touch other parts of the body mm. and to be sexy with words, using the brain, imaging, fantasy. Um, preparing for sex really important make sure you take your pain medication if you're taking it so that it's at its optimal um, mode of action at the time you might be intimate does a warm bath help with emollient a, a, a sit spa does ice packs help do warm packs help what else might help you relax meditation um, uh, candles um, just taking the time for yourself to kind of prepare for and optimize the experience which um, are using erotic material to get some arousal going, if that's helpful to you. Um, scheduling. Um, people don't want to schedule because they think it should be spontaneous. But if you've got vulval pain, you need to schedule very often so that you can make preparation. And in fact, often it just doesn't happen if you don't put it in the diary. I, I really struggle with that. But when people do start diarying it, um, we, we don't have trouble diarying going to a movie or going out for a meal. So why don't we schedule intimate time to make sure it happens? Preparation is key. I've said that. Don't sabotage. Don't start looking at your emails just as, when you think romance is in the air. Because there might be an email from your boss saying, want this report on your desk tomorrow morning. It's not going to help um, the scene. Uh, people pick an argument. People look at social media, find someone really close to them is ill. That's not going to set the scene. Um, Con uh, context, which I've talked about in a longer runway. I love this metaphor. I had someone recently saying, I need a longer runway. And his partner said, but I'm a helicopter. So we were in trouble there. Uh, the longer runway meaning build up, context, time to get used to it. Uh, so hopefully the next, yes, these are the, some of the books that I recommend um, and um, a couple of websites I've talked about. Um, Betty Martin, and now um, I'm happy to answer. I'll have a go at answering your questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Selena. So, stop share. Right. Fantastic. Thank you. And we may dive a bit deeper into some of those resources you mentioned, um, but let's have a look at some of the questions that, that we have. And you mentioned vaginismus, um, so let's start with that um, question that's come in. Uh, other than using dilators, what effective ways are there in working with vaginismus? Now, we don't tend to talk about dilators anymore. We talk about vaginal trainers hmm. because we're not trying to dilate anything. And I only um, talk about them as a choice because it's very much up to the woman whether she wants to use them or not because they're very invasive um, and clinical so it might be that she'd prefer to use a vibrator or a sex toy so that she can arouse herself before attempting to use something she might prefer to use fingers or her, pa or her partner's fingers um, inserting something into the vagina is about gaining confidence that something can go in there so uh, that's the practical treatment, but the other treatment is very much about what I call the politics of penetration. What does it mean? Um, because vaginismus can be for all sorts of reasons, one of them being fear of pregnancy, for example. Um, I've had a client who I treated or worked with for many months before she confessed that she didn't trust her contraception. So we weren't going to get anywhere because she was terrified of becoming pregnant. She didn't trust her contraception. Mm -hmm. So you really need to explore what is the fear around the vaginismus. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, GPs sometimes just say, right, it's vaginismus. Diagnosis is not always helpful. Go on, off with these dilators and get on with it. Now, why is a woman fearful? What, what is it about? Does she want it in the first place? And I find when I ask that question, why do you want it? I can see the relief. First of all, the shock. Why are you even asking me that? 
it's normal and I should want it. But giving them permission to say, actually, I'm not so sure I want it. And let's explore that. Yeah. Okay. So um, some of the uh, ladies will have a partner at the moment and others won't. Um, so with someone who doesn't have a partner and they've not had penetrative sex for five years, how do they start exploring that side of themselves and, and that potential to maybe look for a relationship or just getting started again? Well, I think you start like any other relationship and at some point you have to try to have the confidence if it looks like it's becoming sexual uh, to say, um, I have some difficulty with um, sexual encounters, uh, depending on the particular woman and what, what it is. Um, it, I mean, if it's lichens, it might be that she's fine sometimes and only, it's only a problem when there are exacerbations. Um, I think that the conversation needs to be opened up. And if there's a negative response, you have to think, do I want to continue this relationship? If the man um, or the woman you know, is not um, interested and curious and um, supportive, then I would be thinking again before pursuing it because you've got to be able to talk about it. Mm. Mm. So, you know, talking about communication, because it's such an important part of any relationship, isn't it? Um, are there strategies or ways in which if uh, a woman doesn't know how to be open, you know, how do they go about being open with their partner? How, how do they tell a partner? Um, I think you, I don't think there's a quick answer to that one. You, you just have to plunge in there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, maybe you, you, um, maybe you've already kissed or done a bit of touching and you might say, you know, I, I'd like to have a conversation or, you know, for example, there's a, there's a, 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 a is it Netflix, I think it's called Sex Education. It's a really out there series on sex and teenagers. Um, it's funny. It's squirm making. Um, it certainly promotes conversations. So it might be that you, that you sort of encourage without saying why you might encourage viewing some material that could be a romantic film. It could be something where sex is in the picture. And by talking about the film, which isn't as personal, you're talking about something kind of third party, it might be a way into a conversation. So you, instead of talking about yourself, you might be able to say, so what did you think when he did this or she did that? You know, that might be a way of doing it, sort of a segue in. Mm. That's, a, that's great. I, I like that idea. Um, how about making a partner feel included if they're feeling rejected or they're not feeling involved? Uh, often when people are being intimate and something goes wrong, what happens is both people turn away. So mm. turn away, go to sleep, cry, get upset, go to the bathroom, they separate. Um, it's important to turn towards each other. And just because maybe it's not gone that well, not to abandon it. I was saying to someone the other day, you know, you have a lovely meal um, and it all looks delicious and then suddenly it's hurting or your tummy's upset, or you suddenly lost your appetite, you feel sick. Rather than walk away from the table and offend your host, you might say, okay, is there something on my plate I could eat? I could eat a few peas perhaps, I could have a spoon of gravy. So if you're in the middle and it's not going too well, rather than abandon it, think, okay, can't have intercourse or can't have my bowl to touch. Could I touch him? Could he touch my breasts? Could he nibble at my ears? What else might he be able to do? So you're not abandoning everything just because one thing isn't working. Okay. Um, and you touched upon sex drive, but again, this is going to be very individual, I know, but any particular um, things you might be able to, to recommend as a way of reigniting sex drive that has, um, this lady says, has become zero due to vulvodynia. So to take it from zero just up a little bit. I think you have to start thinking about sex. Yeah. Uh, it has to enter the brain. So you're, you know, it might be that you're reading some fantasy material 
Um, that doesn't have to be particularly pornographic, but um, it, for some women it might just be romance. Um, looking at um, romantic films, for some women it might be pornography. You've got to kind of, what I say to women sometimes, you've got to send your brain to the sex gym. You send your bodies off to get sort of fit and, and exercise, well not at the moment of course, but you know, you've got, to, you've got to get your brain to the sex gym and start thinking about it. And also not think that you've got to suddenly go from zero to a hundred in one go. Um, that's where, um, if you look at Dr. Betty Martin's website, the 12 minute game, it's 12 minutes, but it gets you thinking, where would I like to be touched? Where would I like my partner to touch me? Thinking about what might be manageable and what might be nice. And that's a kind of slow and gentle way in. Mm. Okay. Um, and we'll have a look at those, those books again in a, a bit more depth, those resources again. Um, I just, shortly. just just on the last question, mm. also um, underwear, um, candlelight uh, can make people feel sexy. It's not so much for the partner, but women can feel sexy if they put on sexy clothing. And that can be much more effective because the partner's just going to take it off. I mean, they might enjoy it, but it's actually more for the woman herself. What makes her feel sexy? Does it help if she's done her hair in a certain way? Or, you know, um, you know, now that we're in summer, being naked in warm air, you know, noticing what feels sensual, noticing what you're enjoying. Yeah. I suppose that goes back to the, the reason um, behind why you want sex in the first place. Oh. You know, why do you value it? And really getting in touch with that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so a very straight question. What can I do to make sex less painful? Well, I think uh, Dr. D'Amalio uh, um, uh, covered a lot of the medical um, issues. Um, it depends what the problem is. I mean, I think it's, it's the various ointments that can help the local um, uh, anaesthetics uh, oral pain medication to some extent, the preparations I've already talked about. Uh, something I sometimes suggest when the pain is in the posterior fourchette, which is the six o'clock um, place where often fissures and tears happen, uh, this isn't for everyone and it might be too much pressure, but I call it the shoehorn technique. If you put the finger, your own finger, over that area and then the penis slides across your finger, once the penis is inside, it can be less painful. So you're sort of shoehorning him in and you're protecting that area from the entering because it's often when the penis enters the vagina is when that particular area is at risk. Uh, chain different positions. So uh, rear entry position is not, uh, there's no pressure really on the vulva in the same way as say missionary position. Mm -hmm. uh, the woman on top can be helpful. Um, using pillows and props to arrange your body in a way that might uh, relieve pressure, depending on, on where the pain is. Um, the other thing is that in, with inexperienced couples, uh, and even experienced couples, um, you need to guide the penis in sometimes. You can't assume the man, I mean, the penis, as I've said to people, doesn't have eyes at the end of it. So, you know, the man's head is at a great distance from his genitals. He can't actually see where he's going. So guiding the penis in can be helpful because if he's prodding around, that's going to be painful. So, so helping him along can also help. Yeah. <laughs> great. Um, and lubricant wise, are there ones that you particularly find uh, ladies? Uh, use that are useful? Um, yes, lubricant. The oily version is not compatible with condoms, it's important to know, but they are organic lubricants and there's a, a variety of them. There's a Yes website. Um, silk is also a natural lubricant. Um, now, I'm not sure that it's recommended, but um, some of the emollient creams like Cetraban are not sold as vaginal lubricants but can be helpful. Um, there is another one, I'm just trying to think of the name, uh, Replens. 
Now that one um, lasts for two or three days. So you might need additional lubricant at the time of, of being sexual. Um, th that's available on prescription, as is yes, I believe. So um, they're quite expensive. Um, so it's worth finding out if you can get them on um, prescription. There's another one made with kiwi gel, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, probably if you googled kiwi, kiwi gel lube or something, you'd find it. Great. So the other thing that is re-lube is uh, women with vaginal atrophy post-menopause or if they have um, premature menopause is that um, there are um, local estrogens that you can take either in the form of creams or pessaries, vagifem is a pessary, can make a huge difference to the skin in the vagina and help with mm. um, preventing uh, urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women. So that's really no reason for that for vaginal atrophy to stop sexual intercourse if you want it, um, if you are being treated in that way, and they're not systemic, so it's only treating the local area. Okay, we do have a question on on vaginal atrophy. Um, a lady's been struggling with it for a year. She says, "I feel like it's ruined my life. Is it possible to enjoy sex again?" Yes. Um, but I, she might well need to be using one of these um, uh, uh, medications. Okay. All right. Um, so we've got questions coming in live. Um, one on endometriosis and, and vulval pain. Any advice um, on, on that? As far as I know, endometriosis isn't affecting the vulva so much because it's about the lining of the uterus growing in other places in the body. Um, but certainly it can cause pain during sex and just general pain. Um, so if it's been diagnosed, um, I mean, it can only be diagnosed through laparoscopic surgery and often uh, lesions can then be cleared out. Um, it is a difficult uh, um, one. Uh, sometimes uh, they're prescribed the combined pill in order to um, uh, prevent the ovaries from ovulating. I'm not an expert in this area, but um, I think the same kinds of things that I've mentioned um, apply. Um, but, you know, it's a difficult condition. Um, there's a lady who are, uh, who says, um, after sex, I get sore for a long time, so that it's easier not to have it. Is there anything she can use to help? She's used the normal lubricants. Are there strategies or something you can recommend for after sex to calm things down? I'd be wondering how long she's having sex for, uh, first of all, because sometimes um, sex can last a long time. Um, the average might be sort of three to five minutes, um, but there are men uh, who want to go on a lot longer than that. I wouldn't say that there are that many women who do because the vagina gets sore. Uh, it's important to relieve the bladder before sex mm -hmm. and after sex and in the middle if you need to. I know it's not very romantic, but it's better than getting a UTI. Um, I'm wondering if she is using lubricant and whether she's actually got a problem, uh, a reaction to the lubricant, um, because some people do, and some of the lubricants out there have all sorts of preservatives in them. Um, it may not be an effective lubricant. Some of the water-based ones, I think, are not particularly helpful. Um, I'm wondering if she's sufficiently aroused to be relaxed, how long the foreplay is. Um, I think, you know, sort of ice, cool, you know, cooling, uh, um, uh, cooling water rinses. Um, if, she, you know, some women do find the ejaculate irritating, so I'm not advocating a douche, but a shower afterwards might be helpful. That's uh, so that you're removing the ejaculate and you're removing the lube if you've used artificial lube. Um, and then maybe you're using a little bit of emollient cream afterwards if the vagina, if the vulva and vagina feel dry. All right. Um, we've got a few people raising their hand. If I can suggest um, instead, if you'd like to type directly into the chat box, then we can see your questions as they come up. 
and hopefully get them answered for you. Um, all right. So someone has asked whether they can see the book lists again. Would it be all right to bring that? That uh, actually, I can share it here. Okay. Um, let's do that. Now they aren't specific to pain, but they cover a lot of things around sex and difficulties with it. Okay, so here are the resources. Um, do you want to talk us through these resources a little bit, Selena? Yes. Uh, Come As You Are is a book um, which is helpful for women who are not quite sure about their anatomy and physiology, um, who perhaps have never masturbated or touched themselves. And I think it's uh, women need to take responsibility themselves for their own uh, sexual pleasure because I think um, how can they explain to someone else what they enjoy if they don't know themselves. So that's a very readable book um, on that. Uh, she also talks about breaks and accelerators you know, what puts you off sex, i.e. looking at your phone just before bed, etc., which I've talked about, um, and what are the accelerators, what help you um, uh, become more interested. Mind the Gap is a very new book by Dr. Karen Gurney, who I used to work with. Uh, again, it's very readable. She talks about um, what I'd refer to as the politics of uh, penetration, uh, the history uh, of, um, of women not being really regarded as, as counting in the sexual um, field in, you know, that, that it's only really in the last century, perhaps, that we've really thought about women and how to, how can they get what they need. Um, but uh, it also talks, that's a really good one about how do you increase desire and interest. Mm. Um, a Tired Woman's Guide to Sex, that's an older book. Um, I haven't read it absolutely through myself, but they did do some research using that and women who had lost desire. Mating in Captivity and other books by Esther Perel. Uh, she does some really good um, TED Talks. Um, and again, she talks about how do you keep interest going in a long-term relationship? Um, and again, it's about making the effort. Uh, sex is effortful. Good sex is effortful um, and takes preparation. Um, but she talks about, I'm trying to think of an example. Oh, for example, you know, if you see um, your partner from across a room flirting, possibly uh, talking with great passion about something they're interested in um, and you see them from afar, um, that can feel quite exciting because they're not needing you at that point. But, you know, they're going home with you and you see other people's interest in them. So that's an example of how that can boost sexual interest. The five love languages we've talked about. Uh, oh, I've talked about um, working out, you know, for example, someone might think I love making my husband cakes. That's my way of loving him. I just love cooking for him. And he's sitting there thinking, I wish you'd stop making the cakes and just sit and spend some time with me. Mm. And if you can have that conversation, you can, but you, know, you can still make the cakes, but also give him some time. There are people culturally wise who are find it really difficult to give verbal affirmations you look pretty today, I fancy you, I love you in that dress, I really appreciate that you've made this dinner for me. Some cultures just don't do that. They don't believe in it. I had a couple where um, while the woman um, was away on a business trip, her husband painted the bathroom. And she told me in the session, I came home, the bathroom was painted, it was fantastic, I did a little dance. And I said, did you tell him? And she just looked and said, no. And I said, why not? And I, I, I was, she was from an Eastern European country, actually. And I just thought, why didn't you tell him? He was sitting in the session with me and he was like, why didn't you tell me you, you saw the bathroom and you liked it? You know, so these verbal affirmations can be really important and they can help get people in the mood. You know, to, if, if someone says, you know, uh, you know, I love the way you're dressed today. And, you know, these subtle little in, in, indications of interest can be arousing. BettyMartin.org. Uh, Wheel of Consent, Three Minute Game I've talked about, uh, Touch. Um, that's especially useful if there has been any history of abuse or you've been in relationships where um, you've not, you've what we call disassociated, where you've kind of gone through with sex but really unwillingly and um, uh, kind of going through the motions. Um, um, and that's a good one to think about, uh, you know, what, what is going on here, who's doing what to whom, um, is this okay? Um, sensate focus exercises. I use those a lot. 
Uh, that's a website that describes them. I think that's difficult to do without the support of a psychosexual therapist. They are touching exercises. They start with touching that is not sexual and work towards being sexual. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I don't know how you do that easily without the um, sort of accountability of a therapist to take you through them, to report back. A lot of it's about reporting back on them. Um, and uh, encouraging communication about what's going on during them, but they are very um, useful. And it, you know, uh, I think if you don't have access to a therapist, it's worth reading what they're all about and, and perhaps having a go. Mm. Okay. Um, so great resources there. Hopefully, people have made note of, of those. Um, you touched upon shame earlier, and. Just, uh, Get out of oh no, you, can I? That's get me. Yes, oh, yes. Right. I can. I can stop the share. So, um, how to overcome shameful feelings and negative perceptions about sex? I think that's a really difficult one. Um, I think again, if you're working with a therapist who is very accepting and normalising things, and you look at some of the literature that I suggested, and of course, there's a wealth of literature out there. Um, and trying to unpick where the shame comes from mm. but it, I'd say that's a really difficult one especially if you've been brought up in some of the religions that really do um, regard sex as shameful unless it's for conception um, mm. and unless it's between uh, adult heterosexuals I mean of course it's always has to be adults but you know we have a wide range of sexual interests and um, preferences now and identities um, and if you're not in the predominant one, then there can be shame with that as well. Yeah. Um, and so really seeing a therapist. Well, see a therapist. And also remember that what people are looking at um, uh, is pornography. And if, if you are comparing yourself to that um, and you think, well, I don't look like that and the shame is resulting for that, pornography isn't real, it's actors often with um, uh, medically enhanced bodies, it's not real. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's important to remember that you're not trying to compete with that. Mm. Um, and if you are, then either you're in the wrong relationship or you need to have a discussion about it because they're not the normal female body. Yeah, yeah. Um, how about anxieties, uh, coping strategies to get over anxieties prior to sexual contact? So um, there's no mention whether there's a, a partner or isn't a partner at the moment, but yeah, coping strategies to get over anxieties prior to having sex. I think one of the things is to say, I'm nervous. Right. I'm really nervous. Mm -hmm. And you've got it out there. And then the partner can say, well, I am too, or... Well, let's talk about that. Let, what would help you not be nervous? Maybe we just cuddle tonight. Maybe we, you know, if it's the first encounter, uh, we, we don't, you know, let, let me assure you that I'm not going to ask you to be sexual tonight. I just want to hold your hand or go to bed with no clothes on or whatever, you know, let's look at the options. Um, but I think by saying you're nervous, it's out there. It has less power over you because it's out, you've said it out loud. It's about communication again. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay, let's just have a look at some of the questions. Um, any good outcome measure tools a physio can use to flag up when a patient may need to see a psychosexual therapist? Um, well, um, if they are very resistant, I mean, if you're using a, a, a pelvic uh, woman's therapist who specializes in, for example, working with vaginismus and hypertonic um, uh, problems, then if, if she's not even allowed to get near the woman, you, you've got a problem. So I think that is an indication. Um, I do refer to physiotherapists sometimes if... Um, I think a multidisciplinary um, approach would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've had women who can't even say the word vagina. So, you know, we might spend two sessions just looking at the language because it's so terrifying in some way. Um, 
I think I'm sure they have their own outcome measures. Uh, they have biofeedback, which can tell them how tense muscles are, etc. Um, you know, but if they're not making a lot of progress um, and they sense that there is, you know, a psychological, uh, well, there always is a psychological contingent to it, but if they feel that that is really sabotaging progress, then a referral, I think, is indicated. Unfortunately, the NHS has a bit of a postcode lottery on psychosexual services. They're not available everywhere. Mm. Um, so often people have to resort to private uh, mm. therapists. Okay. Um, any tips on relaxing the pelvic floor? I've just seen something come up. Um, is there anything you can recommend to change my perception from expecting pain to be able to relax and look forward to intercourse? To be practicing intimate touch without intercourse so that you do not have to fear it. Uh, the sensate focus is an example of that. So that perhaps your partner's fingers can get very near the vagina, but there's an absolute promise, absolute boundary that they are not going to attempt to go inside. So that you can begin to relax instead of getting tense as soon as the fingers go anywhere near that area, you can trust him to touch. And as you, and as you become relaxed, and the fingers can slowly get nearer and nearer the vagina over weeks or months sometimes it takes, then that is uh, one way. The other way is through physiotherapy um, and massaging the um, uh, tight areas. Um, and, um, you know, some yoga positions are helpful. Meditation can be helpful. Um, if you are someone who's walking around a lot of the time with a hypertonic um, pelvis. But, it's graded exposure to um, fingers, to penises, to whatever's going to go in there. It's letting things get closer with knowing that they're not going to go in. Yeah. And getting used to that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that answers the next, qu next question, how to start. So really sensate focus is a, is a good way, that graded exposure. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is let's not forget oral sex. Uh, because tongues are not as long as penises, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but they are gentler. And um, again, in preparation, if you enjoy oral sex, you can ask your partner to shave, use some soft softening cream uh, so that he's got either he's very clean shaven or his uh, beard is softened. There are moisturizers for beards. Um, if he doesn't like, because uh, I certainly am not recommending um, shaving or waxing or things that can add to pain in vulvas, ingrown hairs, etc. But if he doesn't want a mouthful of pubic hair, you can hold the labia majora back so that you're helping him access um, the vagina and the clitoris with his tongue. Um, so, it, you know, you've got to work together on this. Um, but that's another option. You know, think about how can I help him access it? Mm. How can he help me by being as soft um, and um, as least irritating as possible if you're going to receive oral sex? Mm. Okay. Um, uh, there's a question come in about lichen sclerosis and we've had a few on skin conditions. Um, do you have any tips for women with LS where sex is painful due to splitting or tearing of the skin? Well, you can't. You just can't do it if it's torn. Um, I think you have to um, have a broad, broader sexual menu, so that mm. when that's happening, you say, "Well, what else can we do?" Yeah. Um, and have a, 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 a partner that understands that sex uh, intercourse, anyway, is not always going to be on the cards. Mm. Uh, but you know what? It, it's not a sexual dysfunction. I think that's important to think about. It's a condition that affects sexual function that's different so if you can if people can start to think well i don't have a sexual dysfunction i have a condition that affects my sexual function just as if you had rheumatoid arthritis you wouldn't if you had a flare-up of that you wouldn't feel like sex so it's trying to think of things in a different way intercourse is impossible i've got a, 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 you know this tear that's got to mend what else can we do great um, so it looks like we've answered um, 
pretty much all of the questions. Oh, oh, Selena mentioned biofeedback. What is biofeedback? Thank you. Now I know that's the area of physio, but <laughs> biofeedback is when they place uh, something in the vagina and they can test how tense the muscles are, and then it actually comes up on the screen and tells you. I don't quite know if it comes in a graph or numbers or what because I don't use them, but but that's what it is. Yeah. The so they can measure issue. progress, so they can see um, how tight the muscles are. Um, so look, you know, we seem to have answered all the questions that have come in live. Brilliant. Um, the key takeaways that I've um, got from this is that communication is key. Um, whether you have a partner or you're going into a new relationship, um, exploring, you know, yourself, your, what desire means to you. So making those kind of explorations yourself and then exploring things together a little bit of a wider focus um i wonder do you have any final messages for for those watching i think what i started with a, a, about be careful not to blame the pain to be thinking um about what can i do not what i can't do and that just and that don't get too intercourse focused because there are many other options to being intimate and sexual. Mm. Um, so think about what can happen rather than what can't. Mm. And if something starts to happen and is painful and isn't going the way you want it to, not not to turn away but turn towards your partner again. Communicate and think. Okay, this isn't going to happen, but what could happen? We st we've got the you know prepare as well. Don't be afraid to schedule intimate time. So you're not mm. doing it just before you're going out or you've got to go onto a Zoom call or something. You know, <laughs> give yourself an opportunity. Don't sabotage the opportunity. Yeah. Great. And there's some great resources there too that you've mentioned. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Selena. That's been so helpful. And I hope um, so. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so next week... Um, we have an expert panel on uh, Dr. Liz Venner's back, consultant dermatologist, to answer more questions on lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, and skin conditions. Mary Chestnut, advanced pelvic physio, all your physiotherapy questions um, can be answered then. And we do have a lot of questions that were sent in um, over the past few weeks that we'll get to. Um, and uh, I'll be there too. So any questions on pain biology, the role of the brain, the nervous system, anything to calm the nervous system down, I'll take those questions. And, and between the three of us, hopefully we'll answer more of your questions live on the webinar itself. Um, so we, over the last couple of months, um, our aim was to run these uh, for free, April and May, due to the, the current situation. And your donations have made that possible. Um, and as I mentioned um, at the end of today's webinar, afterwards there'll be a screen popping up. Um, if you're able to make a donation, um, that would be wonderful, only if you can. And in the replay, you'll get that too. And we've got our expert panel next week. Now, my question to you is, do we extend these free webinars through to June? So I'm going to launch a poll just to see, and I've just launched it, and these are anonymous. So just be, be honest, whether you want us to continue running these uh, weekly webinars, um, I don't know whether you can see the poll results, Selena. It's going up pretty quickly. It is. <laughs> well, that's looking quite promising. Um, well, it looks like the majority of you, um, no one said no yet. <laughs> um, maybe there are a few maybes. Uh, we've got, uh, yeah, the, the majority of you have said yes, um, you'd, you'd like them to continue. Um, yeah, 46 out of the 50 on the call have answered and oh, 47, <laughs> a few of you thinking about it. Okay, so look, in that case, we'll um, look to continue these. So our next question is about the webinar timings because we're mindful that people may have gone back to work and our usual timing is 2 p.m. on Fridays. 
Now, is that still going to work? And of course, the replay is still available to anyone who registers. Um, or would a different time, a weekday after six, uh, be more preferable? So I've just launched that poll um, just to see whether you'd like us to keep this regular time of 2 p.m. on a Friday or you'd prefer a weekday slot after six, just so that we get an idea. <laughs> but if this goes 50-50, <laughs> we'll probably do a combination of the two. Uh, 29 of you um, have said keep this slot and 16 of you have said weekday after 6 p.m. If we do keep the Friday slot, then of course, if you register, you'll be able to see the replay and um, send in questions to us. Uh, so that's it for today. Um, Sharon? Yes? No, this, may I just mention one thing I didn't mention? Of course you can. Yeah, uh, That is that there are artificial vagina toys called fleshlights. That wouldn't be everyone's cup of tea. But if there are women who would uh, like the idea of holding those between their legs and letting the man go into this fleshlight, that's an option, um, though it's not for everyone. Um, so I just, I, I just hadn't said anything about that and that might be useful for them to look into. Thank you so much. Um, brilliant. Well, look, Selena, thank you for your time. Um, and we'll probably get more questions after this. So I imagine we may be asking you back at some point in the future for an expert panel. Um, the replay of this will be with you tomorrow and the sign up link for the expert panel tomorrow, where I really hope you'll be able to, uh, the expert panel is next week. So that link will be with you tomorrow. So really hope you can join us uh, next week for that. Thank you all for, for joining us today. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.